the effect was the same as squeezing with uncomfortable, almost human strokes. I scrambled backwards away from the approaching creature. It reached land and pulled itself onto the bank. It stood up. The black cat's weight shifted. Its belly bulged, its lower legs swelled, became shorter and fatter. The effect was the same as squeezing a stress ball. Instead of a creature with a skeleton and tendons and muscles, I was being approached by a thing with the consistency of jelly wearing a furry suit. I screamed and stumbled to my feet. Then I felt icy fingers curl around my neck. I struggled and instinctively horse-kicked my unseen attacker. The hand loosened and I whirled around. I was face to face with Jane. But it wasn't Jane. Her face was round and flat, boneless. The wrinkles under her eyes had smoothed themselves out, and her nose bulged like a mushroom. And her eyes, the maniacal glint was gone from her eyes. So was the consciousness. So was the recognition. So was the vitality. Her pupils were so dilated, her irises were no longer visible, and what had been white was now completely red. Her eyes didn't move. They were those of a corpse. Then something in the water grabbed my hand. Something cold and soft and rubber-like, slimy but very, very strong. It pulled me. It was pulling me into the water. Jane stood over me, smiling. She bent down, hands outstretched. Clutching bloated hands attached to rope-like arms that jiggled and curled and changed shape. What happened next is a blur. I remember clawing, kicking, and screaming at the top of my lungs. And then I was running, stumbling, lungs burning, stinging, aching, cursing the spongy, weeded ground that gave under my feet. I pushed through dry shrubs and jumped into the trees, praying I was going in a direction that would lead me to humanity. And the green of grass behind me was only my imagination. Then I was on top of the hill, looking down at Jane's shack. And then I was in Jane's yard. I saw the van and jumped in the driver's seat. Silently thinking the guardian angel that distracted me, so I'd left I'm my reloading. keys in the ignition. I saw the door. I looked up, out the windshield, and into the red and black empty eyes of the thing that had been Jane. It was smiling. She always reserved a special smile for me. I turned the key and gunned it. The van jerked violently. I slammed on the brakes, kicking up dirt like smoke. I felt a sticky moisture against my cheeks. I managed to pull open the door before I projected it. Even thinking about that acidic, rotting seafood stench induces a nauseous tickle in the back of my throat. I'd crushed Jane under the front right tire. She'd popped. The van still ran. I drove it straight to the police station. In the parking lot, I surveyed the damage. The front bumper oh, was dented the and the headlight was out. There was no blood. The mangled metal was splattered with glossy, opaque, white goo. I was on the desktop. I said that Jane tried to drown me in the hills behind her home, chased me to the van, and then I ran her over. But I left out the part where her body had taken on the properties of pasta and silly putty. The cop asked me to start if I'd been doing any drugs, but raped me. Over the next I'm week, reloading. I was questioned multiple times by the police. Their questions became increasingly bizarre, to the point where they were asking about toxic chemicals and lights in the sky. Seriously. And whether I was or had ever been involved in the this was the late 90s. I was chastised for driving down the to approach a crazy woman, but I was never charged with a crime. The cops were cagey, but they'd found something. By the next morning, Oak Tree Lane was blocked off by the county sheriffs, and the inhabitants of the hills had been roughly evacuated with no explanation. Then came more sheriffs, then the unmarked cars, 
then the tall, black, barbed wire fence around the Jane's death was reported as a freak accident. I tried to forget. I holed up in my room, watching happy movies until my mom came to take me back home. I went back to school. I threw myself into studying and applying for college. When I needed to, I snuck my mom's sleeping pills. Eventually, however, curiosity Friendly overwhelmed me. Contact. I wanted Your answers, so I elected to spend the following Friendly summer in my lab for college in Juniper Valley with my father. Will Fell was no more. Kathy had left the animals with a larger no-kill shelter in Acton, retired and moved to Riverside. There was a large for sale sign in front of what had once been her home, and it had been a dry winter. The chain link fence, broken and bent, still surrounded Lake Colette, but the lake was little more than a puddle. I got a job waiting tables at a bar restaurant. I spent my nights serving burgers to bored townies, trying to strike up conversations about the strange events of the previous summer. The fence, the crazy cat lady. I was offered nothing but rumors, speculation, old fashioned lies. Finally, I met a man named Aaron. He was in his 20s, chubby and socially awkward. He worked as a counselor at a camp for disabled children. He talked about Dungeons and Dragons a little bit too much, and his uncle was a local cop. It was a slow night. I shot the shit with Aaron for a while. When I asked him if he'd heard about the crazy cat lady who died last year, he played it off like a tabloid headline. But I noticed him hands tremble. I guess I got lucky. Aaron's cop uncle apparently had a weakness for Jack Daniels and a tendency to ignore potentiality when drunk. And that weakness must have been genetic, because an hour later Aaron was singing like a canary. The Pretty night Jane had tried to kill me, two cops went to my home off Oak Tree Lane, expecting to find an empty bottle of Everclear and a discarded bag of shrooms. Instead, they found what had been Jane. Pieces of her were scattered across the ground like debris. They radioed for backup, and a small posse spent the remainder of the night on a scavenger hunt for vital organs. They found skin. Plenty of skin. The piece that was folded into one of the top. Her bones and organs seemed strangely melted, as they were pulled from a vat of acid or digested. It was like one officer had said, Jane had been skinned from the inside, then filled with acidic goo like a water bottle. Everything was coated in a white, translucent, jelly substance. The officers had taken a sample to be tested, but by the next morning it had evaporated into a powdery white stain. The big guns were called in. Sheriffs, agents from multiple government divisions, he couldn't say who exactly. The local cops had been pushed out of the investigation by that point. He had heard that upon searching Jane's property, they found an axe, multiple firearms, boxes of ammo, and ten cat skins buried a foot and a half deep in the backyard, mostly with their heads detached and all coated in the familiar white powder. They scoured the hills behind Jane's property and they found the pond. The small pond that, according to land surveying reports, had not existed before the earthquake and the rains of the previous winter. They drained it. At the bottom, they found 24 more cat skins. At no point had they been cut apart or sewn together. Again, it appeared as if something had eaten or dissolved all the blood, bones, and vital organs. Except for the teeth and the eyeballs. The Hold eyeballs were left in fact to stare hauntingly into oblivion. After the discovery, they dragged Lake Colette as well. Aaron didn't know what they'd found there. The citizens of the away. It's been nearly 20 years. I'm, I'm a veterinarian now. I've done some digging into the thousands of quarters of the internet where I've seen things I can't unsee and some new friends. 
But I still don't have answers. I don't know what changed Jane's cats that summer. Possessed. I think it was something in the water. Hyper intelligent blob like things that had been dormant for years and brought to the surface by that earthquake. But this is all conjecture. All those years ago, the Chuggy Camp counselor, everything. He listened, eyes wide, but never doubting. The next morning, I took his car to the wrestling blue mailbox. Finally, the abandoned shack where I passed so many summer days. We hiked a mile into the hills, carrying two shovels and my father's rifle. We found the hole that had once been found, now a weeded ditch. We got to work. It was hard work. It was dirty work. It took a few trips, but by the end of August, we had another boat that completely filled the hole with dirt. I don't know what was down there, but if there's more, they're not getting out. My name is Eric Williams and I work as a political reporter in Washington, D.C. I cover Congress, the President, and whatever happens to be the trending topic of the day. I have a couple of sources that I trust and a few that I don't. But as luck would have it, I have found that my most important source of reliable information turns out to be my dog, Apple Jacks. Let me back up a little. About three years ago, I was heading out of my apartment building to do a follow-up on a story, when I heard a rustling in the hedges that flank the wide stone steps by the entry. I figured that it must be the raccoon who had been getting into the dumpster, and I gave it no more thought. On my return trip at around 11 p.m., I was halfway up the stairs when I heard a low whine coming from the bushes. So I backed up and peered into the dark undergrowth till I spotted the reflection of two eyes looking back at me. They were a good three feet up from the ground, so I started to back up when I heard the unmistakable low thumping of a slowly wagging tail. Hey there, I said in a calming voice. I moved back and sat down quietly on the bottom step. You hungry, bud? Unzipping my backpack, I fished around at the bottom, but all I could find was an energy drink and an old single-serving pack of cereal, Apple Jacks. I opened it and set it down on the step next to me. It took a few minutes, but then he slowly stepped out of the bushes and made his way cautiously towards the food. He was big, but I could tell he was less than a year old. He was real thin and looked like he hadn't eaten in a while. Keeping one eye on me, he gingerly sniffed the Apple Jacks. Then hunger must have overtaken him and he wolfed down the cereal. He flipped the bag over with his nose, checking to make sure he hadn't missed any. Then he looked up at me. I let him sniff my hand and then slowly gave him a scratch behind the ears. Tail wagging, he climbed onto the same step that I was on Then he sat down, leaning against me. And that was it. We've been together ever since. I looked online, checked the papers and the local bulletin boards for a few weeks to see if anyone was looking for him. After a while, I stopped checking. Soon, we settled into a routine. I took him out in the morning and he slept for most of the day. In the evening, we went for a long walk in the the enemy. The park that he was in was sort of exotic in a very rich section of the town, and the slightly run-down section of where my park is located. It's a huge park that goes on for miles, with a small river running along the length of it. There is plenty of room for him to chase a ball or run around with other dogs, but it quickly became apparent to me that Jax didn't like the company. He wasn't aggressive, he just ignored them. They would approach him, tail wagging and playing, but he kept his eyes on me. 
Along the river, there were several old stone bridges, and he loved to run down them. A million miles an hour. Race across, then turn around and come back to me. This ritual would be repeated at every bridge. I would stand there laughing, urgently calling him back, as if it was a life and death situation. Sometimes he was a little late with the brakes and he would plow in the landing us both on the ground. Then, one particular Tuesday evening at the park, he crossed the bridge and stopped on our side. He stood there in the back of the woods. He glanced back as if he found us. Then he headed straight for the woods. I called him. By the time I made it across the bridge, all I could see in the distance was a man running over something on the ground. So I ran. What happened? I called out. As I approached, I saw the man had tears in his eyes. There was a golden retriever on the ground in front of him, and Jack was laying with his head on top of the dog's chest. Did he hurt you, dog? I asked. No, the man said. I think he saved him. My dog was having a seizure. They're usually quick to stop and like calm him down, but this time he would stop. Not until your dog was to calm him. Will you be able to get him home? Enemy over uh, kilo inbound. Yes, I'll carry him. We we'll live just package. over there. Incoming. In a large house up on the hill. Well, I, I better get him home. Thank you. The enemy is gaining ground. About a week later, the truly responded us at the park. He waited and walked over with his dog. It turns out he was looking for us. It turns out his name was Gregory Williams. It turns out that he was elected to the house. I am buying Jack's burger on the way home. Maybe two. Friendly UAV on station. Since then, Gregory up on a story. I am always careful to keep his name out of it. We met at the park as usual. Enemy, While the dog told me he was leaving early for Christmas break, he took me to a cabin in Colorado. He invited me to come with Jack's corpse. I said that sounded great, but I couldn't take that much vacation. Nothing's happening in D.C. until after all this. He reached for my phone. That's the phone for Abby. Get away as soon as you can. Drive up to Colorado Springs and call me. I'll direct you to the cabin. Anyone else you like. My wife and kids are dying to meet the hero that's like our dog. And you. I laughed. Okay, I'll try. Get there by the 15th of December. I'll give you the story of a lifetime. Then he nodded and walked away. His dog followed behind. I stood there silently watching him go. Back in my apartment, I poured scripts of dog into and I heated up some leftovers for myself. I had an interview tomorrow morning with Senator Susan Collins, the chairman of the Housing and Urban Development Committee. So I sat down on my computer to finalize my questions. I turned on the local news as background information. There had been nearby. A 10-year-old had gotten lost and then was found safe at a local Walmart, and Skywalker's name had a spectacular show in two weeks, when a comet makes its closest approach on the 16th of December. Jax was sound asleep by the time I finished up and went to bed. I awoke one morning to a soft beep with a message left on my phone. It was the Senator's secretary canceling today's meeting. I called her office to reschedule, 
but there was only a recorded message saying the senator's office was closed for the holidays. With the morning off, I took Jax for a leisurely walk. Then I caught the train to the Capitol building. I walked over to the congressional offices to see if I could gather some info on an upcoming vote. The guard checked my press ID and nodded. I walked down the quiet hallway to the elevator. Stepping out on the fourth floor, I turned right and stopped. Ahead of me was a long hallway. There must have been 20 small offices. Every door was closed. Lights off. This was very odd, so I got back in the elevator. Stopping at every floor to check, the entire building was completely empty. This just doesn't happen. There are always congressional staff milling about. On my way out the door, I asked the guard what was going on. He just shrugged and said, no idea. Grabbing a coffee from a nearby street vendor, I sat down at a bench overlooking the main walkway. Taking out my phone, I called my list of political contacts one by one. Either there was no answer, or a message was left saying, I'm sorry the office is closed for the holidays. The Congress was slated to work until December 21st. Votes were scheduled for each day. This just doesn't happen. I sat there thinking, vaguely aware of the tourists passing by. A family with two kids sat down on the bench next to mine. The kids were asking their dad, will we be able to see it? Yes, their dad answered. You might not even need a telescope. Suddenly, I got this vision of thousands of people gathering with binoculars, having comet-themed parties, all the while, silent doom approached. Tossing my coffee into the garage, I headed to the train. I arrived home, took Jax out for a quick walk, and said, What should I even look for? No, too many amateur astronomers out there. The news of the catastrophic impact would get out in public. I spent the next week and a half achieving little to no results. Nothing in the news but excitement over the easily visible approaching comet. Found nothing at the doorway. It was around 11 p.m. when it finally occurred to me that I should stop looking in the present and try looking into the past. I typed in the history of comets. Comets shed a lot of debris, pieces of which can slam into Earth. Comets can ignite a higher forest. They can also produce a high altitude. A comet is linked to the Justinian plane It was the first reported instance of the Black Plague in the when some struggled to clear the streets of the dead. There was the Comet of the Black Death in 1347. During the winter of 1664, a bright comet was seen in the London sky. The Black Plague ravaged England for the next two years. I stopped breathing, and I realized that something was coming. Washington was the last place I wanted to be. It was a full of the early of 2015. If I threw my stuff in the car and drove straight through to Colorado Springs, with a little luck, we could make it. I looked over at Jax. Want to go for a ride? Hostile counter UAV overhead. The enemy's taking the knee. Taking fire! Loading! Throw a grenade! The old line. After uploading a number of horror stories to various places around the internet, I was overwhelmed Banana. by the sheer volume of supportive Banana. emails and messages I received. To write more, to take my ambition seriously, and to commit an increasing amount of time to the pursuit of becoming a published author. 
little did I know that this newfound acknowledgement of my writing would lead to a series of horrific and abhorrent events. Moving. For over a year, I received numerous messages and emails, most very positive and enjoyable. Yet every few days, I would also be a strange, disconnected, and fragmented piece of correspondence in my inbox. Each email would consist of one random word as a subject. The message itself comprised of a single phrase, normally only two words long. The email address would change each time, but it was clear from the nature of the content that the author was the same. At first, I dismissed them as the actual product of a board worker on the internet, attempting to amuse themselves with the thought of myself, puzzling, yet worrying encrypted messages as the days wore on. And the emails became gradually more twisted and pathetic. I began to suspect that they were of a far more sinister origin. I had posted and contributed to many websites and forums and videos, and it was not unusual to wake up each morning to 20 or 30 new emails in my inbox. I often spent my lunch break answering them, and I genuinely enjoyed the correspondence. However, the day after posting a story, I followed my usual routine of logging into my email account at noon, only to find one message which stood out most uncomfortably from the others. The subject was suffer, and the email itself contained just two words, baby cries. I sent the message to my trash bin and thought it was worth it. It had been a long day, and as I had been writing from dawn to dusk, I was tired of writing, feeling suitably ready for a good, long overdue sleep. It was around 11.30 p.m., just as I started to drift into a dream that I heard a noise. It was not out of place, nor did it cause any real concern to me, coming as it did from my neighbor's house through the wall. It was the type of common sound any resident is familiar with. I smirked to myself, thinking baby cries, and drifted back to sleep, sure that the child's mother or father would soon be there to comfort it, as they always were. I woke again, glancing at my mobile phone, which cast an unearthly green glow around the room. Seeing that it was after three in the morning, I became agitated knowing that I had a long day ahead of me. Rest does not come easily on those nights when we know we must rise early. The mere thought of the necessity of a good night's sleep before the next day's work precludes any notion of sleep itself. Lying there, I listened in the darkness to the infant next door, breaking its heart, inconsolable and distraught. Surely the parents had not let it scream for all those hours, lying there alone in blackness at night, unattended. After trying to block out the child's cries for what seemed like hours, I admitted defeat and moved to the spare room that my family and friends normally stayed in, on the rare occasions when they visited. At 7.30 a.m., my phone alarm sounded, and after fighting the reality of another day, I reluctantly left my bed walking slowly to the kitchen to make some coffee. From the window, I looked out onto the street below. What I saw horrified me. A police car and two ambulances parked outside of my neighbor's home. Even through my groggy, pre-caffeinated mind, the memory of that helpless child crawling in the night sprung to the fore. Immediately, I stopped what I was doing threw on some clothes, and ran outside. I was not the only person watching, as the usual nosy residents stood at their doors, with some even out on the street, still wearing their dressing gowns out of gossip, looking up and of scandalous rumors. Asking several onlookers what had happened, I was told a variety of accounts, from a child being abducted to someone having a seizure during the night, 
the a hush area. fell over the street as my neighbor's front door finally opened. Target area located. Slowly. Secure the hard point. Three police officers exited the house somberly as a collective gasp seeped out from the mouths of the crowd of onlookers. Quickly Secure behind, the two men in sterile white clothing carried a stretcher, and on it, a body bag containing the now deceased remains of one of my former neighbors. A few cries rang out from across the street. Those who knew them wept, while those who did not gossiped. Then, another silence followed by another stretcher and another body bag. This time, no one uttered a sound. The street was void of noise. A tangible tension spread through the air. As all of us waited, hoping for home, for no more death. Heartbreak. The last stretcher supporting a small and insignificant shroud was carried some in one air and placed carefully into the back of an ambulance. Tears were wept and answers were demanded from the police. But I could not cope with the sight. I could not bear it. The sound of that poor infant screaming through the air screaming for its very life rang out in my ears. The sound of a child, now forever silenced. The memory was deafening. How was I supposed to know? The child had cried before, as many do. I didn't know. I didn't know. I walked days through my garden and into the now hollow sanctuary of my house. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried. Cried knowing that maybe if I had just paid attention or shown more concern than simply getting to sleep, that if I had noticed something was amiss, I could have called the police and then Several hours later, two police officers arrived at my door to ask if I had seen or heard anything unusual from the night before. They said that they were not able to tell me what happened, but that any information I could give them would help immensely with their investigation. When I told them about the email I had received, they looked at each other with an obvious sense of skepticism. When I showed it to them, they asked if they could have my login details in an attempt to trace where the email came from. Of course, I gave it to them and they left after saying that they would be in touch. As soon as they were gone, I returned to the computer screen to switch it off. I recoiled in horror at the sight of another cryptic email sitting in my inbox. The subject heading said, Fan. And the email again contained only two short words. Two words which drove fear through every part of my being. It simply read, I was utterly prepared for the events which followed. Grandpa was 97 years old when he passed away. He lived far from where his three children had settled. Grandma died when I was a small child and ended up marrying another woman a few years later. We demanded that we move out west so that she could be nearer to her sons. She was a piece of work, was Grandma testimony. We all wondered how Grandpa could stand her. It turns out that perhaps he couldn't. We're not precisely sure of the Reloading. but it was probably years before we noticed it. He'd tell us about people he was speaking to or visiting with, or a trip he'd taken. We've lost years field. later, Fight after back. we learned he was suffering from dementia, we'd learned that conversation, Five that trip, that it never actually happened. For all we really knew, any story he told us from the last decade could be a false memory. 
we would have no way of knowing. Hester rarely communicated with us herself. Probably Grandpa wasn't himself that night. Happened a few weeks after he came back east to live with his Most of my family had settled in one area. My wife and I lived in the south end of our city, as did one set of cousins. But my father and his two sisters all lived in the north, within driving distance of each other. A few of my aunt's children then moved out of town, and my brother had as well. But there were still enough of us for Grandpa to visit with. We would often have gatherings at my parents' house, where Grandpa would either hold forth with some story, or just go to sleep. Who was like 18 at the time, came in from playing with my cousin's kids and sat down at the table where Grandpa had been napping. He suddenly woke and smiled. Well, he said brightly. Claudia was my aunt, Dad's youngest sister. I'm Brienne, Grandpa, said my daughter. Five point no, relocating. said Grandpa. Almost sounded offended. You're my daughter, Claudia. Same month, he told my aunts and uncles the story of how he came out east after living with Hester for two months. Uh, the I prayed to the Lord, said Grandpa. And the next thing I knew, Martin was here. Martin was my father. I remembered him driving out to the tiny cold house in Hillen, Colorado to get Grandpa. He had not come due to any divine intervention. He had come because Grandpa called him in the night and pleaded with him to come get him. We all loved Grandpa. For one thing, Grandpa had come into his head that he was a young, single man with many years out of him. And the only thing missing was a young woman at his side. If he spoke for any length of time with a younger woman, he became a and perhaps she should be his new bride. Hester was even still alive at this point. He had forgotten her utterly. The women he made advances on two of my cousins and my own wife. Thankfully, he couldn't do much more than talk, so it was just a matter of politely changing the subject. But it got worse when he decided he could do things like take walks on his own or try to drive my father's car. Dad and Mom didn't let him go on walks by himself. But that didn't mean he didn't sneak away sometimes when Dad was away and Mom was in the basement. He had to use a walker to get around and simply couldn't do stairs, but refused to admit this to anyone, including himself. This led to a lot of falls. He would also get confused as to where he was or where he lived. At times during his walks, he would attempt to find the old family home that he had raised my father and aunts in, despite it having been long gone since before I was born. Dad picked him up from the police station where he had been taken after some patrol officer saw him wandering around, clearly lost. The time he tried to drive my dad's car was after that. He decided that the reason he had gotten lost is because he had had to walk. He managed to get the emergency brake off and rolled right down the fairly steep incline outside my parents' house, crashing into a fence. The damage was minimal, but after that incident, my parents realized he needed to be in a full-time care center. It got worse after that. My father visited him three times a week. I have no idea how often my aunts went or if they even did. I tended to only go when there was a family gathering, and increasingly I began to realize that he had no clue who I was. He'd smile and greet me as though I was someone who was smart. He'd tell me about his children, describing them as little kids, and even go as far as to invent a friend who was looking after them while he was in his home with all these old people. Grandpa was 93 at the time. He was much older than many others but somehow they were the old people. He was not. When I say things got worse, I mean he changed. The false memories, the refusal to acknowledge that he was elderly, the attempts to chat up ladies and inability to remember that his children were grown, 
and they get very Boy. That changed one night when Dad was called to come to the facility quickly. Grandpa had wandered into the wrong room and had come out screaming, raising his walker up in the air and slamming it into the ground. He even took a few swings of people who tried to call him down. He began accusing the staff of stealing his things. He was bellowing as loud as he could. Give them back! Give them back! I wasn't there for it, and I still have a hard time picturing it. Grandpa barely raised his voice above normal volume and appeased. Somewhat. He had a can of Insure and a tube sock and almost hit my father in the head with it when he came in. He apologized. Dad was one of the few people he always recognized, and said he had been waiting for the thief to come back. A man who'd steal from me would just as soon kill me, he explained. The insure in a sock was his weapon to fend off the thief. Later that night, he told Dad about how much it had scared Florence. He hated that she'd had to go through that. Florence was my grandmother, the one who died when I was six. He finished by saying that Florence had gone somewhere, and when he went looking for her, They told me she was dead. One day, they're gonna come looking for me, and they're gonna find me dead. That was a jolt to my father. Grandpa had never, at any point before that, acknowledged his mortality, his advanced age, or the fact that he'd probably no more than a handful of years left, at best. Aging and death was something that happened to other people. But here he was, accepting that death was near. That wasn't the last night he mentioned the thief. He even gave the thief a name. Charlie Rosen. It was strange that he would invent a whole person, name included. He didn't even name the friend who was looking after his kids. In fact, that person ceased to exist. Charlie Rosen had stolen his kids had killed Florence, had come to his home in Colorado and routinely taunted him, beat him, and he had even declared that Hester had been sleeping with him. He remembered her now, and was certain that she and Charlie were gaining up on him to make his life a living hell. In the last six months of his life, he was suddenly agitated. Dad could not have a single word mentioned Charlie, and then the violence started up again. In one visit, Grandpa accused Dad of being Charlie and attacked him. After that, Dad's visits dropped to once a week, and he didn't stay long. Once, I went with him. It was the last time I saw my grandfather alive, and I will never forget him. He's here again today. Grandpa told us as soon as we arrived. He told me I couldn't leave this room. He's trapped me here. Dad, this is where I live. My father tried to explain. See, here's a picture of Mom. Why would Charlie let you keep that? You killed your mother, you know. Said Grandpa. Murder her in your sleep. Mother had an aneurysm. Target area! You and I decided to get her to the front of the She died in her sleep, no one killed her. No, no, it was Charlie. Grandpa's voice was not agitated. It was solid, like he knew the fact of what he was saying. He made something go wrong in her head. I didn't know it then, but I realized it later. After he introduced me to Hester, conned me into marrying her. Charlie. Dad finally had enough. There is no Charlie, he said. You aren't supposed to correct people who have dementia. It just confuses them more than this. 
missing that moment. Holding. Charlie is someone with a gun. Secure the target Mom area. died naturally. You met Hester at a coffee shop years after Mother died. And while she was not a nice woman, she was not unfaithful to you. So please, stop talking about Charlie. We are aboard in heaven. Secure the area. He got to you. He told you to say those things. You're a part of it, too. Uh, Grandpa, I said, why don't we start a game of checkers? You should even love checkers. I don't want to play any fucking checkers. That's real, Grandpa. I couldn't have been more surprised if he'd hit me. By words, he called them. Bad men, as far as he was concerned. Now with you, now with him. Charlie Rose is pet demons. He comes to me every day. He talks to me. He taunts me. He reads my mind and he takes thoughts away and puts in new ones. Worse ones. He tells me about how he rapes my little ones. How he and Hester I can't stop him. He will go inside my mind. We left after that without saying anything. Driving home, Changing back. This is a raving, violent lunatic. If it wasn't right, he wasn't there. What kind of monster was Hard this Charlie? Stand by. That thought is cold. For an instant, I had accepted that Charlie was real. Giving my head a shake, I was all to think about something else. The but an image of Charlie had been forming in my mind. Beginning a few months back, when Grandpa had first started talking about him. I only now realize that when Grandpa spoke of this man, I was picturing him in my mind, and I could see him clearly. I thought of the last time I visited Grandpa in that tiny house in the mountains of Colorado when I was a teenager, sitting at that little round table while Hester served us in the very end of the block. And I would see a man standing in the corner of the kitchen, watching us eat. Confirming that card. A tall game of leathery skin stretched area. and corded muscle. Shaggy gray hair hanging down, obscuring the other part area. of his face. His six, smile soldier. stretching like a nice out of the wedding. I was 12 years old. I met Hester for the first time. And standing behind her was that same man. I remember that I was gathered in Grandpa was currently standing. Didn't we pass that man in the hallways? No, no, of course not. These were just images that I might have looked up the more Grandpa had talked about this shady character that never existed. The brain can do that. Insert in your memory just because you decide subconsciously to remember them. It's just another way for your brain to play tricks on you. Grandpa had invented a person who he talked about with such conviction. If Charlie was real, Secure the target so area. my mind had conjured up a Charlie Rosen. But Rock there was a Charlie Rosen. Grandpa died two months Secure later. I remember the funeral like it was yesterday. I still wake up at night in a cold sweat, remembering. Everything was normal at the start. Our whole family gathered under the same roof for the first time in years. No one was missing. The service was nice as well. The pastor who served the spiritual needs at Grandpa's facility was the officiator. Grandpa looked calm and peaceful, whole, 
so unlike what he had been in the last few months of life, I started to feel calm myself. That was where he belonged now. Where the devils of his own fever became gray and couldn't get to him anymore. And then we drove to the cemetery. The coffin was lowered. We all sprinkled a handful of dirt on the coffin and began our walk back to the cars. The shadows to start shoveling. I could barely read the embroidered name tag. It looked like Sea Rose or Sea Risen. No. It couldn't be. He was a tall, gangly man leathery skin, sharp looking bones, folded muscle, and long gray hair, and that smile. I watched as this phantom dumped shovel after shovel of dirt on my grandfather's coffin. He was laughing softly under his breath, and I Today, I felt like I had to write all this down. To make sure that I remember things get worse. Because today, my father called me to complain that Charlie was driving past his house and staring at the windows. My aunt is a con artist, and she learned from the best. Her father. Grandpa never made it big, but he lived for the game. Under the radar was probably what made sure he didn't get caught. Not once. He was so proud of that. Mom didn't take up the family business. She got religion instead in her own tax account. It's so ironic that it sounds like a joke, but it's true. Dad was always the best for helping out with math homework. Mom's more colorful relations were kept at a figurative arm's length throughout my childhood, lest they corrupt me following a more interesting life path. Aunt Cassie was the only one who could wiggle her way into my life. She was fully licensed as a psychologist, which made her a smidge of a Probably not intended by the university who issued her degree. Aunt Cassie was a psychic. She had a shop on everything. Crystals, herbs, candles. Anything needed to fill the mystic void was for a healthy markup at her little store. There was even a private room in the back that was used for seances. As both my folks work, I would often get dropped off at the shop where I would help Aunt Cassie out with those little shows. Anything from messing with the lights to working the walls. an effective one. Customers came to get chills the first time. Why not provide? Cassie helped me become the skeptic I am today. I showed me all the behind the scenes slide of hand. We'd watch daytime talk shows with magicians and mediums, and Cassie would explain every step, from a basic rundown of cold readings to how to spot an audience plant. After one particularly convincing episode, I asked the natural question, couldn't some of it be real? My aunt's reply was firm. The dead don't talk, kiddo. It was her conviction more than anything that made me believe her. There was only one client I ever saw my aunt refuse. He was old, bald, and stooped. He took his hat off when he came inside and twisted it in his hands as he talked. Cassie tensed up immediately when she saw him. The man claimed to have worked in the prison systems. Death Row. 
he'd been responsible for carrying out the final punishments of the worst convicted criminals on the planet. In his old age, this tormented him, ate at his soul. He wanted Cassie to contact the souls of the ones he'd killed so he could apologize and beg forgiveness before he joined them. My aunt threw the most epic fit. I'd never seen her so mad. She hollered and threw things, shouting for him to shut up and get out. I hid under the counter with my hands over my ears until he left. Later, I thought her reaction was one of fear because of the man's job. An executioner has to be a con artist's worst fear. Eventually, I got found out. I wanted to put on a magic show for my folks, and stupidly, I thought I'd do a medium bit where I pretended to talk to a grandpa from mom. Huge mistake. Mom freaked the hell out and banned me from seeing her sister ever again. I'd left some textbooks at the shop, though, so I got to run in and grab them while Mom fumed in the car outside. Aunt Cassie didn't even have to ask what was wrong. She could read my face after all. I gave her a hug and a teary, snot-filled goodbye. She did tell me one last thing to go. Kiddo, there's a curse in this family that's passed the torch. I hope to whatever gods might be out there that I don't have to come to you when I go. We didn't get to talk to him for more than nine years. That's when Facebook became popular and no parental ban could help me from sharing the internet. She'd had a tough go of life. To pay bills, she went honest. And with her business went all her zest and playful passion for life. One day, I got a message waiting in my inbox. I love you, kid. Reloading! Remember what I told you. I dialed her number and already crying. No answer. I didn't stop Target down. Again, and again and again and again and again. I was too much of a mess. To the police did that for me, though, the next day. Car accident. Standing by. Driver. 1-1, one, one, requesting recon at this blur. time! Okay, that, Relatives I'd never here. seen in the flesh packed the church. I sat between my parents and that racked my been brain bad. trying to figure out what it was my hand had Taking out. effective fire! We I'm followed reloading. the first to the cemetery in dead silence. The priest did the last little speech, and then I was left alone by her headstone, still straining to remember what she had told me. Little did it sit in the conversation My mother said something about how it was a shame it was such a small turnout. Small turnout? That bothered me. to say something and finally understood. Behind my parents there was a whole host of people, all standing and staring at them. My parents weren't paying them the slightest attention. The priest muttered some soothing condolences and excused himself, walking right through the thick of the crowd without disturbing a single soul. At the head of the group, Looking just like the day I'd seen her last was Cassie. All the rest and peace sentiment in the world wouldn't have done her any good. Her mouth was wide. Why? Just like that, I knew. I know what the family curse is. I know why the dead don't talk. Busy. if things can just be born. In this enlightened age of ours, concepts like good and evil are often painted as out of order, archaic even. According to modern thought, people, animals, obviously, 
are simple products of their environment and no more responsible for their actions than a twig in a string. But I know better. Some things are just born bad. About ten years ago, we had a German shepherd named Dutchman who had a litter of puppies. Six Reloading. Like any other shepherd you've ever seen. The seventh was a snowy white. Not a true albino, just white fur with a black nose and blue eyes. There was never any doubt about which one we were keeping out of that litter. We named her Princess. Before the end of six months, any plans we had about giving away or selling the others became a moot point, as all of the others were dead. We just fired at the rate of about one a month, not mangled or anything, just dead as if they died in their sleep. It's not their mother. It'd be the first litter and all was accidentally crushing or smothering them. Later, we had no doubt as to what had killed them. Within a year, she came to dominate her mother. Her father, tough old alpha that he was, and to a degree, us too. Her parents shot away from her. When we put her, she went to her heart's content, unchallenged by the other two. I need medical! Once I tried to shoo her away and let the other two eat, she snarled at me, bearing those perfect white fangs to her black gums and loosing a glass that I felt it in my guts more than heard it. After that, I left her alone too. I've often wondered if the parents of serial killers know that they have a monster in the making. I mean, sure, some of them are to blame for how their kids turn out. Products of households with fire. systematic abuse of possible flavors. But then, there are the ones that seem to be true aberrations. It's those families I'm curious about. Do they smile and laugh and pretend that everything's fine? I know that we sure did. We downplayed the weirdness around Princess, tried to rationalize her behavior, the bizarre complete. things she did, Mission. like killing rabbits and leaving them hung up in the bushes behind our home. Some dogs do that to show they love you. Cats too, I would say. To them, it's just bringing you food. To me, it's like she's haunting us. Just like the puppies years earlier, not one of those rabbits ever had a mark on them. Princess, just like her mom and dad, was well looked after and never heard for a meal. So it wasn't as if she was hunting for food. Her innumerable kills were always untouched. No, the only thing I ever saw her eat was a kitten. We had some feral cats in the woods around our house, and one mama cat had a litter in our tool shed. I returned home from school one day and headed around back to look in on her. The door to the shed was open, and inside I found Princess, her jaws pink from her feast. As she devoured that last kitten, her beautiful blue eyes never left mine. The mama we found displayed on what I'd come to think of as the rabbit dish. The tipping point came that same year when we found the fire dead. He was the best dog we ever had that we ever will have. We woke one Saturday morning to find him in the backyard lying dead without a mark. I can count the number of times I ever saw my father cry on one hand. That was one of them. It was also when we found out how she killed so cleanly. She strangled her prey like a jaguar. The fur of the father's neck was still wet from her saliva. We spent that morning burying that good old faithful dog, and then he sent me and my mom away. But there was no doubt about what he wanted to do. I'm sure that there are some people reading this that will find the notion of putting an animal down to be abominable. But what other options did he have? Take her to an animal shelter. Give her to some other family. Who could do that and go to sleep with a clear conscience? As it turned out, we weren't getting any sleep that night regardless of our decision. 
We spent that afternoon at my uncle's house. Once, when I came in from playing to get a glass of water, I opened my phone and that she sometimes wondered if the dog was possessed or something. I had sometimes wondered the same thing. Later that evening, not long before sunset, we got a call from Dad. Apparently, the deed was done. By the time we arrived home, he'd already washed up and changed clothes. But there was little he could have done to hide his wounds. Even less to hide the haunted look in his eyes. Bandaged, and that was bad enough. But what stuck with me all these years later was just how terrifying he looked. It wasn't until I'd actually been through remaining. combat that I recognized that expression. It's how they look after they've oh, stared at the face. My father dragged him from up the street to come help. And it's from Mission him now. that Return I get this part of the story. Princess was many things bloodthirsty and evil, but stupid wasn't the one of them. And that, nothing else, she took after her father. Her dad, Rocky, was famous for letting himself into the house if it was storming out. He'd figured out how to paw open the sliding glass door out to the patio. What was really astounding is that he also had the presence of mind to close it behind him. Not being stupid, she knew something was up and made herself scarce, disappearing into the woods. Dad, not wanting to put this off and being in full-on revenge mode, called his friend from down the road and filled him in. So off on the hunt, the two of them went. In his own words, she was laying for us. If it sounds absurd to say the princess lay in ambush, then I failed at conveying just how wrong everything about her truly was. She led them on a chase through those woods, barking whenever it seemed the stupid humans had lost her again. Then she laid up beneath an overhang on a creek bank, just where the path crossed it, and she waited. She was on my father the instant he stepped down into the creek, grabbing his leg and making him fall headfirst into the water. Then she went straight for his throat. My dad had already lost his rifle at this point and he grabbed her with both hands to try to fend her off, wrestling with 115 pounds of teeth, claws, and muscles.